I'm S.A. Bradley, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror, where I remind you that you used to love horror movies, and you secretly still do. Hi, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of Hellbent for Horror. Thank you so much for still hanging out with me. And I've got to tell you, I am so happy and grateful that I still have this platform to be able to do what I love to do, which is talk about the genre of horror and find people that I can have conversations with. When I first started this podcast, I said something very simple, which is the reason that I do this is to start conversations with you. And that really is still the most important thing. I've been able to travel all over the place to be able to sit with people and talk about our favorite subject. Meeting people at their passions is such a rewarding thing. And it has allowed me to start friendships, have myself uh, involved with many different art projects. So many different things have happened because of the fine art of shooting the shit. (laughs) The idea of just sitting down and a sense of playful conversation about something that you love. Now, why am I bringing up all of this about conversation and uh, this this meeting of minds? Well, a couple different reasons. Let me see if I can slowly explain. So at the beginning of this month, April of 2024, by the way, two major events happened almost simultaneously while I was traveling to the state of Ohio. The first was my pilgrimage every year to Strongsville, Ohio, to return once again to Cinema Wasteland, which is the Cinema Wasteland Movie and Memorabilia Expo that happens there. So that's one thing. The other was that Cleveland was one of the places in line for a total solar eclipse. So dig the synchronicity here. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we have a convention the Cinema Wasteland Movie and Memorabilia Expo. And on Monday, the very next day, we have a total blackout in the middle of the day. We have a solar eclipse. Oh, I don't know. (laughs) Is there some kind of foreboding there? I'm not sure. But anyway, after coming back from Cinema Wasteland, I really felt it was time to do another show about the event and what it means to me and why I'm still going and what it means to other people as well. And there are a couple reasons for that, Uh, one of which happened last year, middle of the year, I believe. And it was where I was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, to go to StokerCon. And while I was there, I found out that uh, through one of my friends, John Kitley, that the Monster Bash was happening that same weekend. Now, I'm, you know, involved in StokerCon. It's a kind of a big event, but I had heard about Monster Bash as being another kind of convention that is in the vein of Cinema Wasteland. And in fact, uh, the way that Monster Bash was mentioned to me or described to me was that it was the sister show to Cinema Wasteland, and it is more of a monster kid bend. So something that is more universal monsters, something that's more hammer than it is uh, in Cinema Wasteland, which is a little bit more skewed towards the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, Uh, essentially 70s and 80s, probably more than anything else, that whole drive-in exploitation thing. So a very simple way that Monster Bash was mentioned to me was that Monster Bash covers all the movies until they added color to the blood in the movies. And once there was red colored blood in the movies, that's where Cinema Wasteland (laughs) took over. I had never been there, but I had been told that I really should go there. And so I was always really excited to see what this is going to be like, especially because I really do love Universal Monsters. I love Hammer. I love a lot of the old stuff as well. So uh, I decided to go there. And one of the things that I did find there, first off, it was a lot of fun. Certainly the people there are knowledgeable, but there was something that I really noticed that started making me think about Cinema Wasteland as well. And what I really noticed there is that, you know, time is marching on, folks. And the monster kids are, of course, the kids from that grew up in the 50s, 60s. 
And they're the people who started the first zines, started the first conventions, all of that stuff. The monster kids uh, that were under Forey Ackerman's power uh, with uh, famous monsters of film land. They're all aging out. And so as much fun as I had at Monster Bash, I could feel that shall we say, aging process happening. It was very hard to get across the entire vendor's room at any given time because there were a lot of people moving very slowly in walkers, canes, in the little carts. And, you know, you could just feel when I stopped and looked at it, I was able to uh, take a look at the folks and, of course, young at heart, tons of laughter, lots of fun. But you could feel that at some point, this really is going to wind down. In fact, if I remember correctly, one of the uh, founding members of Monster Bash, the people who put it on, had passed uh, a year or so ago. And so there is a sense that this is all finite, right? We all know that it's finite, but we're, uh, we never really think of it in those terms. Cinema Wasteland has become such a, an important part of many of our lives that we don't ever want to see it go away. But there are things that are pointing to the idea that it is going to wind down at some point. We're, we're, we're aware that it's going to end sometime. There are little hints that are happening. Ken Kish, who is the founder and showrunner, has had health problems. And, you know, he's getting older. It's getting, you know, harder to do some of this stuff. Is it really worth the, uh, the amount of uh, aggravation that can happen to put this show on every six months? Uh, well, you know, uh, that's up to Ken. But there has been talk uh, over the last few years of him flirting with the idea of maybe retiring this. And Cinema Wasteland, from all intents and purposes will end when Ken decides that it's going to end. He's not going to bequeath it to anybody else. At least that's not any of the scuttlebutt that's being heard. So there's been that in the air for a little bit. You know, we're not getting any younger. Uh, health issues are coming up. Uh, of course, there are expenses. Another issue that happens with a show like Cinema Wasteland is that the people who are the draw they're also aging out, unfortunately. Uh, many of the people who are, have been working or did work in the time of the slasher films or time of the drive-ins and the grindhouse movies, uh, they have uh, gotten much older. Uh, some are not willing to get on planes and come and visit. So there is that kind of thing as well. And we've all been kind of holding that in the background, while we're enjoying Cinema Wasteland. So one of the things that really got me, and I think many other people thinking about uh, the impermanence of things, was something that happened not even at the hotel. It actually was something that happened on the other side of the very big parking lot that there is, and that was at the Super 8 Hotel. So this Super 8, why it's significant is that it tended to take in the overflow. This is how well attended Cinema Wasteland is. Most of the time they take over the entire hotel and they sell out the hotel. So one of the things that has always been a great standby for people is the Super 8 right across the parking lot. It's also a little bit cheaper. So people who could not really afford an entire weekend at the Best Western, they were able to uh, bunk together and make it work for, with the Super 8 there. So what ended up happening? Well, developers came and they tore down the Super 8. January 4th, 2024, the shot heard around the world. We saw a news article that showed that developers were going to tear down the Super 8 hotel and replace it with a Sheets gas station. Having that Super 8 go down was kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of like hearing that someone that you went to high school with just dropped dead of a heart attack. And you're like, oh my God, he was my age. And you know, all this, it's, it's coming close. You know, the Grim Reaper is hitting close to home. Well, there certainly is that feeling around Cinema Wasteland and that Best Western. So the Best Western, which used to be a Holiday Inn, has been the one and sole place that Cinema Wasteland has been for the last nearly 25 years. Since 2000, twice a year, they've been showing up and putting on this show in the same place. Now, 
A couple of years ago, the Holiday Inn was bought and turned into a Best Western. But in the time that I've been going there, which has only been since 2017, there have been quite a few, shall we say, changes that had been happening. The hotel itself hasn't necessarily been kept up. It's modest in how it works. Uh, everyone makes jokes about how the elevators fail every weekend because, of course, everybody's using it. But you start realizing that they're not putting a huge amount of money into this hotel. So you buy a hotel and instead of fixing the elevators uh, properly, you walk into the elevator and you look up at the ceiling and you realize that the ceiling tiles are being held in by bookshelf arches. In other words, <laughs> the little flange that holds the bookshelf up, they're being held up by those. And you're going, oh my goodness. And they've just been screwed in there. Sometimes your door won't open or sometimes it will with the key. You have to get the key done several times. Uh, there's a lot of quick turnover. It doesn't seem like we have the same people, the same personnel that are working at the hotel. Uh, every six months, it seems a little bit different. Whereas there seemed to be mainstays that were there all the time and understood what was going on in a weekend of Cinema Wasteland. There's just this feeling that, you know what, if the developer's ball smashed down the Super 8, you know, are they really putting in the, the money to keep this one going? And I will say that in my own personal opinion, I would think that considering the amount of time that's been going on with Cinema Wasteland, the amount of success that has already happened, how everybody's getting older, I don't know if I could see Ken going out, Ken Kish going out and finding a new place if this one decided to go away. So I think that shot over the bow of uh, mortality really soaked in to a lot of us because there was an interesting difference to Cinema Wasteland this time. Not a bad difference, but a difference. But because of that, I'm going to talk a little bit about Cinema Wasteland, what it's meant to me, the changes that I've seen, and also give you a little bit of an insight from people who have been here for a while and people who are new. A little bit of an idea of what Cinema Wasteland means to different people. For those of you who have been listening to the show for a good amount of time, you know that I did an episode early in the creation of this podcast, which was episode four, actually, and it was called Blood Oaths and Bar Tabs, My Initiation into Cinema Wasteland. And, you know, that was kind of like my origin story. It was where I went from going to a convention and meeting some like-minded people in Chicago to them saying, we have a lot of really cool people that I think you would love to meet, and they're all congregating at this place in <laughs> Cleveland, Ohio, and you should come. It was Thursday, March 7th, 2016, and that was the first time that I walked into what was then the Holiday Inn in Strongsville, Ohio. It was the night before Cinema Wasteland, my first Cinema Wasteland was going to start, and because I fly from San Francisco to Cleveland, which is insane in and of itself, I get there a day early. What this does sometimes, it allows me to meet people before the chaos of a live show starts to happen. So I get there, there's commotion uh, behind the open ballroom doors, and that's this big ballroom that has all the vendors, and they're all setting up, and it's really kind of provocative to look at them. I'm like, oh, wow, look at how exciting it is in there. You can't go in there. I have no idea what the rules are. I don't want to get kicked out, but it's obvious that they have someone at the door, so perhaps you're not supposed to go in there, a and I'm looking in and it just looks like it's fun like the circus is fun right the circus has come into town i knew nobody but you know that didn't stop people from coming over and saying hi and seeing uh who i was and where i was coming from and a couple guys came over uh one guy named brian huey another one named tom nisner they came over and they offered me a beer now this is an interesting thing because i don't drink and, you know, nine out of ten times when you're someone who's a non-drinker and you walk into a kind of a party atmosphere and people hand you a drink and you say no, they go, oh, okay, cool. And then they make their way away from you because literally that 
thing of handing a drink to somebody is the conversation starter. It's a thing that you have in common. It's this uh, little exchange of gifts that allows the magic to start to happen where we decide we can talk with each other. And I've been in that situation often where I walk up and somebody offers me a beer and you know they just kind of walk away afterwards. They're very friendly about it, but they're looking for someone that they're going to have a, a, a strong conversation with. That didn't happen here. Because the strength of the conversation, the linchpin, wasn't going to be the beer. It was actually what I liked to talk about, which was horror. Why are you here? What do you like? What are you doing? And so uh, I immediately had two people who spent a good amount of time with me talking about old movies, talking about new movies, talking about music, because I found out that Tom Nisner uh, is, I believe, the lead guitarist to Cardiac Arrest, which freaked me out. I had to go upstairs and listen to some music uh, and, and go, oh my God, okay, I better be on my best behavior because it seems like everybody here is doing something, something really interesting. And Ken Kish came and introduced himself to me, uh, of course, because it's a small concern, a small group, same people working the same doors, the same people are putting out all the different VIP passes. My name stuck out. They knew kind of to look for me. So Ken came over and he gave me a quick lay of the land. A few minutes later, guests came in uh, and that was people from the movie Street Trash. Uh, so James Lorenz, kind of important because this uh, year James Lorenz was back. Jane Arakawa, Roy Frumkes was there. Uh, I got to watch these people over that weekend. So the thing that uh, was important about that was I was immediately made to feel welcome. Uh, I was drawn into the mystery rather quickly, and it wasn't too chaotic. And so those things were big draws for me for that first wasteland. What I find as the weekend continues, when the people who invited me finally show up on Friday, John Kitley and a few others, they are so happy to see me, and they start introducing me to people that are around. And what I notice is that just about everybody I meet is either in a band, uh, they're either artists of graphic artists, or they're film artists, or they're uh, writing books, or they're making reference books and nonfiction. Uh, there's all this stuff that's happening. So I'm meeting so many people, I'm talking to so many people, I've never had that many genre fans all at once that are truly engaged and fun and erudite uh, and loquacious, that by Sunday afternoon, I've lost my voice. And I will tell you that when I booked my flight to go to Cleveland that first time, I was pretty sure, I was pretty damn sure that this was going to be a one-off, that I was going to do this just to say that I did it. Tag, you're it. Fantastic. Great to meet you guys and see you guys again and to meet these new folks. It's been wonderful. But I figured it was just going to be a nice story to tell. But since 2016, I have been to Cinema Wasteland enough that I can walk the Cleveland airport with my eyes closed and still make it to the baggage and find my way to the bus or to the rental car area. It has become something of a pilgrimage for me. And I'm not alone, obviously. There are many people who uh, have been doing it for much longer that also feel very strongly about it, maybe even stronger than I do. And we continue to meet. So, you know, thanks to the passage of time and the idea that everything is impermanent, I wanted to talk a little bit more about why I went back to Cinema Wasteland, <laughs> because it is a bit of a, a chore to get out there uh, from where I am. It doesn't make a lot of sense, quite honestly, but emotionally, it most certainly does. And of course, as I mentioned before, I'm not the only person who feels that way. Now, here comes the complicated part of the story. Why is this so exciting and important and interesting to us? When I first did the show back at episode four, and I was flush with the new excitement of finding something so unique and interesting and fun and small and somehow precious, it was a hard sell for me to talk to people about it already. And what I mean by that, about it being a hard sell, it's not a hard sell for me to talk about it. It was a hard sell for people to understand it or be excited by it themselves. It takes a certain type of person. I don't mean that in the elitist way in any way, shape, or form. It's that this is a very shaggy dog kind of thing. And I think because of that shaggy dogness, 
It's actually why it survived in the, the fashion that it has for 25 years with very little change and deviation to it. And yet having this really strong fandom that keeps it alive and keeps it viable for everyone. But if I was to describe it, you know, you're going to go to Strongsville, Ohio, not Cleveland. You might see the lights of Cleveland, Ohio, but you're really essentially kind of in the woods at an airport hotel. In other words, the people who are there are essentially are the airplane pilots and the uh, hostesses uh, all there staying overnight. You're going to be in a Holiday Inn slash Best Western that is in need of a little bit of a shampoo the food is, you're going to have to travel to get any food there. People who are going to be there are people who haven't worked in the industry for probably at least a decade. Some of them are still working, but most of them are not. Uh, the people who are going to be there are vendors who have been doing this for quite a bit of time. They're kind of like deadheads. Uh, they go from place to place selling their wares just to be able to go to the next show. And the movies uh, that you're going to be talking about are ones that uh, that are being showcased, at least that have the guests there, are not mainstream fare. So there's a lot of things in there that are not necessarily super appealing uh, to most people, or at least it doesn't sound like it's going to be stunning, right? That's the thing. I mean, people can get that, oh, it's going to be uh, this kind of thing. Okay, it's uh, more of a memorabilia show. Uh, people who are there are uh, ex-actors, not necessarily actors. Uh, got it. There's uh, not really great food there. Uh, don't take the elevators. Got it. Okay, so you're traveling how many thousands of miles to do that? It does. Uh, it, it does sound a little bit strange. So this is the thing that is kind of a conundrum about Cinema Wasteland. It's more of an emotional thing uh, uh, than it is something that's going to make a lot of logical sense. And yet that emotional thing can be incredibly intense. So let me see if I can come up with a comparison that may help people understand why Cinema Wasteland matters. So when I was a kid, Growing up in Pennsylvania in the 80s, there were just two major social events that were there for teenagers at that time. One of the things that were uh, big social events was cruising, uh, you know, blaring loud music out the car windows. Even in the winter, you just put on extra coats and you kept the windows open so that everybody could hear whatever music you were playing. Most of the time, it was loud rock. Uh, and the other event, that was happening uh, was hanging out with a few dozen teenagers. Get this behind the dumpster in the Burger King parking lot. So there was a Burger King uh, at the corner of two major intersections and all the kids would congregate there, go in, grab some French fries or a burger or a drink or whatever, and then quickly go to the back area where there was a big old dumpster that hid everybody from plain sight. So you'd walk around uh, puddles of garbage juice and to get to this private party that was behind a dumpster, which kind of hid you from the rest of the world. Now, in the early 80s, uh, you know, vagrancy was a big worry. Why are these uh, teenagers congregating? And I think that may still be a problem anytime the teenagers congregate. Uh, older folks get a little bit nervous. So they started cracking down on us. You know, police would show up at different places. And so one of the answers was, hey, the kids don't have anywhere to go. The only reason they're doing this hiding in a, behind a dumpster in the dead of winter to hang out is because they don't have anywhere uh, legitimate to hang out. So adults in their wisdom decided that they were going to build a brand new community center. So they did a pretty cool, you know, state-of-the-art kind of community center where you could go there after school and play games, you could learn arts and crafts, you could maybe learn, take classes on different languages if you wanted to, uh, things about local plant life, whatever it was, basketball courts, there's stuff for you to do. So they cut the ribbon to the thing, and for the first month, everybody's going there. Uh, but then all of a sudden, nobody's going there. You know, it is a teen center that is astonishingly unpopulated by teenagers. Where did all the teenagers go? 
Well, they went back behind the dumpster Burger King. You know, we all went back there. Uh, you know, why? Well, I can tell you it's not for the decor. Uh, it certainly wasn't for the warmth that we had. And it certainly wasn't for the, the occasional smell if you got downwind. You know, sometimes places just have a unique energy. What makes them special, you can't logically quantify there's nothing remarkable about that dumpster. It was <laughs> like any other dumpster at any other eatery. There was nothing wrong with a community center, but you know what? That building just wasn't the right place. Whatever the right place means, it just wasn't that. Something intangible, something unconscious, subconscious, something tied to an event that brought everyone back to that fast food parking lot. Whatever, whoever it was, the first kids that showed up at that Burger King parking lot. I mean, it wasn't even just our generation came up with that. There were like, we were like second generation dumpster hangers. You know, the older brother would bring the younger brother and then he would bring his friends and then the next generation started to grow up. So who knows what the first incident was that was two or five people who first hung out at that dumpster and they said, you know, this was a lot of fun. Let's do this again tomorrow. <laughs> Somehow that happened. There was this Genesis moment and it doesn't make any sense. Who knows what it was, but I can almost guarantee you that it had to do with the fine art of shooting the shit. Fine art of shooting the shit, hanging around, laughing and playing with friends and talking about things that really excite you, that you enjoy so much, add something to your life. You know, you can build stuff like the community center with the specific intention of making it a sacred place like that. And I will say that there's just something strange about these places, a you know, sacred place, holy place, whatever, that we just have to make a pilgrimage to. You can try and make one, but no amount of money is going to guarantee that that building is going to have any kind of personal allure. You know, there are plenty of big conventions out there. They do really well for themselves. And I go to those as well. But when it comes down to a place that I think is really special, I go back to this weird, dingy place in Ohio. Occasionally it snows. Most of the time it rains. Most of the time it's cold, whether it be in the spring or in the fall. Whatever made that place attractive, I can tell you one thing. It happened organically. It wasn't planned from the very beginning. It didn't have a bunch of cooks in the kitchen. It didn't have a corporation behind it. It didn't have a superstar behind it. It just happened. Those things happen. You can't plan sacred places. I think last time I looked at uh, fans.com, which is an online fan convention database, they showed that there were multiple horror conventions that are happening across the United States every weekend. And most of these conventions are very similar. In fact, uh, the template that there is of Cinema Wasteland is not wildly different from any other convention that you're going to. It's, it's really scale. You know, every one of them is going to have featured guests. Uh, there's going to be Q and A, hopefully, although I will say some of the bigger shows don't have nearly as much Q and A as they used to. One of the things that is unique to Cinema Wasteland is that they do show movies, 16 millimeter film every hour that the show is open. And it goes into the wee hours after the vending room closes. Of course, the vending room is one of those things. It's the majority of real estate at any size of convention. So, you know, the one that uh, Cinema Wasteland has is a pretty decent size. It certainly dwarves the rest of the convention. But you have some that are just immense. I used to go to WonderCon when it was held in San Francisco at the Moscone Center. And the vendor's room and the ex exhibition halls was a 500,000 square foot area. Yeah, you know, it's huge. It's like it has its own moon. Now, that can be a very entertaining thing, but it can also be something that is somewhat overwhelming. 
And it certainly is something where you might not get that personal conversation that you're looking for. I do think that the fine art of shooting the shit is one of the big draws that there are to Cinema Wasteland. You know, if I were to make a comparison, uh, big genre conventions like Days of the Dead and WonderCon, you know, they're like mega churches. And you know what? Mega churches can be fun, I'm sure, but that's my style is more like the tent revival down by the river. <laughs> you know, I don't need a family of ministers that are all wearing matching suits uh, up on a 10 foot high stage, you know, bathed in concert lights. You know, they're all doing these satellite broadcasts of their hymns. You know, that's good for some folks. But what I want is I want a crazy motherfucking Pentecostal revival. I want a preacher who sweat through his fucking shirt. You can see his wife beater underneath it. Uh, his belly's hanging over his belt. Uh, he jumps off of the stage and he has to dance the Holy Spirit out and he's like knocking people over while he's doing it. You give me a congregation that fucking interrupts the sermon. You know, get people who are going to yell out and their hosannas and shout and music and get up and dance. They're going to laugh. You know, that kind of thing of unruly passion really does excite me. I want soul, right? I want passion. I want a little madness. I did not know that it had a name back in 2015, but I did find out that the name was Cinema Wasteland. There's no special photo ops. Uh, there, there's not VIP rooms. There's not special dinners that you can pay a hundred dollars to sit and, and watch, you know, John Carpenter fiddle with Egg Foo Young. Yeah. There's none of that. What's the draw? What makes it a sacred place? Uh, remind you that I'm the guy who, uh, one of the great social events in my hometown was hanging out at a dumpster behind Burger King. But I almost guarantee that it might not have been a dumpster there was a sacred place that made absolutely no sense in your life. In fact, I'd love to hear what that is. So feel free to write me after the show. There was somewhere that you went. You go to places that are just desolate, junk-ridden places. That's where kids went to make out. That's where kids went to hang out. Part of it is that you know we couldn't be found. Nobody was really looking for us. <laughs> you know, we were free to act foolishly. We were able to listen to our music as loud as we wanted, talk about whatever we wanted for hours. You know, one of the things that I think is fun about Cinema Wasteland and talking about this communication is that Cinema Wasteland is kind of a place where folks like me have a shorthand around our weird beliefs. Like, you can say, I love Bigfoot movies, and you're not going to have someone go, why? <laughs> and then you have to explain why you like Bigfoot movies so much. You don't have to, you know, have the conversation stop where you go, you know, I've, I've been really into category three Hong Kong horror movies recently and have people go, what? What is that? Can you explain what the hell that is? Or you don't have anybody like looking at you like you're insane because you've seen every movie Joe D'Amato did. You know, maybe they look at you like you're a little bit insane for seeing every movie that Joe D'Amato did, but, uh, it's done in a loving way. There is something cool that people already have a certain understanding. Yeah, you're weird. I'm weird. We're all weird. We're weird together. We don't have to spend any wasted time explaining why we're fucking weird. At this silly hotel, I found a place where all the kids like me hang out, hiding in plain sight. Everybody that I meet at Wasteland knows what they're talking about, but they're able to champion their older horror films. Uh, but they also talk about recent movies and current trends. They stay topical. They talk about foreign horror films. These are people who are excitable. I love excitable boys. And if you look closely, it makes sense that this is where I would find this tribe. You know, large conventions, they're full of collectors as well, sure. And I have to say that I had my 
misgivings about uh, going to Wasteland because I thought, oh man, if it's more like a swap meet, I'm going to be bored senseless because you can't get any good conversation. It's usually the banter of an archaeological dig you'll find at those kind of things. But even though these large conventions have the toys and the autographs and, you know, the photographs and uh, so many people are there for resale value, uh, what we have at Cinema Wasteland is people are connecting more about the joy than it is the thing that's in front of them. You know, I connect with the fans who love the genre so much, they can't remain spectators. The genre compels them to go out and create something. And who knows what it is that they're going to create. They may have a podcast like I do. They may write a book. Uh, they may just paint. Uh, just paint. That's a huge thing to be able to do. Uh, they make t-shirts. Uh, they have bands that play all horror music. There are so many ways that people contribute back into the wonderful River Nile that horror is. We add to the genre in whatever way we can. We feed the beast because the beast feeds us. And so Cinema Wasteland's where the crazy folks go. This time around, I think we were really talking about spending time with each other and the joy that it was to be able to have this ability to sit and let our passions fly. There were so many people that were walking around with microphones and cameras trying to capture, just as I tried to capture, the lightning. So I wanted to do a little bit of an experiment here. Uh, there were a lot of people that I could interview, but what I wanted to do was distill it down to three separate interviews. One would be with someone who has been at every one of the Cinema Wastelands to give their opinion of what it's about and what it's like. And then another set of interviews with a couple that met at Cinema Wasteland. And they've been going there for several years they're uh, people who found the love of it and came back and are now part of the rich tapestry. And then I wanted to find someone who is new to the show. So I found someone who was coming to Cinema Wasteland for the second time. So they got bit by the bug and this is them coming back. They had to return. <laughs> I wanted to interview someone who was new to Wasteland. And, you know, uh, it didn't take long for me to decide to speak to Niv Arania. Now, I met Niv six months earlier at her first Wasteland that was in October of 2023. She was part of Lloyd Kaufman's Trauma Entourage. And if you've ever been to Cinema Wasteland, you know that trauma takes over this corner. If there's anybody who still understands Ballyhoo in this day and age, Lloyd Kaufman does. So he brings all sorts of characters there, Niv being one of them. And so we spent some time talking and uh, we hit it off immediately. Uh, Niv has a very good knowledge of horror and she's a big horror fan. So six months ago, she was at this entourage with Lloyd Kaufman. Six months later, she was back and that was enough for me to want to interview her. So Niv is an actress, a model, and also an unapologetic juggalo. Uh, first question, uh, because people may not know, tell us what a juggalo is. Um, they're fans of the insane clown posse. Do you dress up and everything when you go? Absolutely, every time. <laughs> How many times have you seen them? Oh man, at least 30 times now. Have you ever been arrested while going to see them? <laughs> no, I haven't. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> okay. Surprisingly, no, no, I haven't. Okay, so you're a horror fan, lifelong horror fan? Mm hmm Okay, great. So my question is going to be about what your first kiss with horror was, the movie or the book that you saw that when you saw that you said, I'm dedicated to this for the rest of my life. Hmm. There's a part of me that really wants to say scream because okay. I really loved that when I was growing up. Really, really got into it. Watched it a whole bunch of times over. Still watch it. Still love it. I didn't really super fall into horror, though, I don't think, until I started secretly watching uh, Monster Vision when I was younger. I would uh, put on like Cartoon Network or something like that and then have like the back channel go on to TNT. I would watch Joe Bob, so that was like when I first really got my first taste and... I just remember watching all that crazy stuff. I think Basket Case may have been the first one that I really watched where I was like, what the hell am I watching? But I was so intrigued and I wanted more. I think that's kind of when I like started going back every time. 
How um, old were you at that time? Uh, maybe nine. Nine? Like How did nine. it make you feel when you watched it? Uh, sometimes it scared me. I will say, like, sometimes I got scared over, like, really silly things, I feel like. But, yeah, I just, I kept, I kept wanting more. I kept, I was always craving to see what was behind, like, the forbidden door, I guess. Plus, I also got excited, you know, watching something that my parents wouldn't let me watch, you know. And can I, can I, uh, you know, change the channel quick enough if they're around? So it was almost more that I was more afraid of my parents like, than I was with what I was actually watching. The only thing that really, I think, truly scared me when I was younger was when I saw signs. And the moment, right? The, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, you know, you don't expect it when it happens. And man, that, 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 that kept me from sleeping for like two weeks. I think I had to sleep with my lights on them. Did you have a corrupter? Was there a person who was a corrupter? Or oh, was absolutely. Both of my brothers. Yeah? My older brother is only four years older than me. And, you know, he was the one that would kind of, like, explore. And, like, I would watch a lot of the stuff that he watched. And then my eldest brother, who, you know, had not lived with our family for a long time. Because, you know, he had moved out, had a family of his own. He was, like, an old punk dude. So he would come over and just be like, oh, have you ever seen this shit? This is, this is fucking funny. Like, mom would, mom would hate this, but here, have it, you know? He was, he was definitely like the corrupter, you know? I wanted a skateboard, my mom told me no, and he got me a skateboard, my mom was so mad. I was curious about certain music. I wanted Nine Inch Nails CDs, you know? And he'd be like, here, have the CDs, and, you know, don't tell mom. So uh, I would say that he was definitely the corrupter in that regard, so... Mm. Do you have a, like a specific time when you decided, you know what, I don't care what these other people want. I'm going to do what I want and I'm going to follow my own lead until I find my tribe. Honestly, it's going to sound so silly. I, I think when I finally like decided to like become my own true self and like really like go kind of had to be really when I went to an ICP show because I kind of went as an outsider and I was watching. I was spectating. I was totally watching people and I was like look at these people, you know, I was completely judgmental, and uh, not only did they put on a great show, the fans were the nicest people, they were super respectful, they weren't mean, you know, uh, nobody was being rude, everybody was talking to me, they were just, they were just so friendly, I, I'd never felt so included, and, you know, I felt so terrible about the way that I'd perceived these people, I was like, okay, I get it, I understand why people are part of this, it is one of those things where, like, they embrace the darker side of things, you know, they call it horror core for a reason. I really enjoyed that aspect of it and just being able to be into whatever the fuck. Nobody says anything. They're just like, yeah, that's fucking awesome. Like, you know, fucking embrace it. So, like, no matter what you do, you're always going to be met with, like, um, somebody cheering you on, basically. So, like, you can't really do you can't really do wrong. So, I don't know. Did you find uh, a, a kind of clan through horror as well? I did. Um Somewhat through trauma, um, I actually found a, a handful of people through a bar that I used to work at that was kind of focused on horror called the Crack Fox in St. Louis. And I met a lot of really cool people that, you know, would do indie horror movie screenings there. Um, you know, just cool people that would talk to me about, like, you know, stuff like Night of the Living Dead or whatever. You know, sometimes they'd bring me, like, DVDs. I would go out and actually, like, one of my friends that I made there actually got me to go out to theaters, and that's... I still go out to theaters regularly. I try to do that like once a week. We would actually go out and see a horror movie. And, you know, they would pretty much always be my favorite thing. What do you think horror does for you? What is it that makes you want to come back to it? Is it weird to say there's almost like a... I have a weird desire to find something that can that can truly terrify me to the point where I can't sleep. It's only happened like yeah. once, but uh, as an adult, I should say. And I can watch that movie now, so doesn't bother me. So now I'm looking for the next thing. What is it? Sinister. Ah, yeah. Was the the lawnmower or the um, whole thing? The whole thing. I I, I was terrified by Bagul. Um, <clears throat> I was very terrified by Bagul, and I think that my fear that's associated with Sinister, I've actually talked to a lot of people about this. I think a lot of people that were raised in very Christian homes, and, like, my, my, my parents would tell me, this is so terrible to tell a child, my mom would say, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to burn in the blazes when I was like five. And I still think about that line. You're going to burn in the blazes. So when they're talking about this, you know, curse, where if you look at it, you know, if you just see it, you're basically cursed to go to like this hell dimension. 
you know, it kind of, I feel like it threw me back to that. And I was like having nightmares. I was like, oh God, I'm going to hell, you know, it freaked me out real bad. The, the snuff films, you know, the part of that, that was really intense, I will say. But just the whole being a big ghoul reminded me so much of like the weird inner fear of going to hell that I still have, even though I don't necessarily believe that it is. It's like, it's like a, it's like a scar. You can't, you know, get rid of it completely. I will say that's probably another thing that really got me into um, horror is honestly just truly like my super religious upbringing. I got to go see the passion of the Christ when it came out, even though I was uh, like 12, which is hilarious. Um, Field trip to a snuff film. It's whatever. <laughs> right. Um, I think one of the things that's uh, that has really brought me into it was reading Dante's Inferno. Mm. It's incredible. I feel like Dante's Inferno probably is like the scariest thing that I can think of. And if somebody was able to make a film of that and make it realistic enough, that would that would probably just scare me shitless, you know? <laughs> right. That would be too much. Uh, so we're talking about, we're here at uh, Cinema Wasteland. It has a reputation. Uh, what brought you here? Um, so I actually was brought here um, by Jessa Flux, who has a booth here. We were in a film together called Triple Xmas, which was a really fun time. And the movie is really great, so you should definitely check it out. She had been doing some work with Troma, and the director of the film that uh, we were in had a movie that was uh, streaming on Troma now. So she came up and she was being a Troma, and she was kind of like, oh, I think they need a Troma. And I was like, oh, I'd love to, you know, volunteer. So I volunteered and I, you know, really connected with a lot of the people up here. I really liked the, this is like a very nice knit community here, I feel like, where everybody is just very open and sweet to each other. It's not like a huge convention, like, not like I would say like more hug. You're not going to go around the halls and just talk to everybody, you know. Here I feel like it's more of a constant stopping, talking to people and everybody's, you know, polite and happy to like interact, whereas other places, you know, it's not going to be as much. It's going to be more so like poking around at vendors and like creeping around and, you know, getting your thing signed or whatever. But this one, it's actually more like fans becoming friends i guess and i like that i like the community aspect of it i've met i've met so many people that i since this last wasteland that i still talk to almost on a daily basis nearly everybody that works in the trauma booth is just super laid back and really cool and like because they're really fun to be around it's almost like a second family um i feel very comfortable you know around them i i genuinely think they have the best interest for me it's cool we can just talk about movies and be geeks and you know other weird stuff that we're into and everybody's like oh that's cool or you know even better they might be like that's disgusting you know uh but yeah no 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 bad vibes here at all like it's it's been wonderful I mentioned before that the key thing that I look for when I go to Cinema Wasteland, or really any convention for that matter, is that I want to have conversations. I want to start conversations with people. Now, when you're dealing with Cinema Wasteland, your wish will be fulfilled if you have that wish like I do, and maybe a little bit too much. It's like drinking out of a fire hose. Our late night Algonquin round table of horror, which is just anybody who wants to come in to jump in and start having discussions about movies, can get pretty big. I mean, we can get 20 plus people at the table and have a dozen conversations that are zipping in and out of each other. It's a lot like jazz musicians back in the day where they'd sit around cutting heads. They just start to improvise. And that means that there are people that I get to talk with and I have a great time with and we can laugh and everything, but we don't necessarily talk outside of that milieu. And such is the case with Dave and Amy Runnick. Now, Dave and Amy, I met them, I think, in year two of my time, and we've had many fun conversations over the years because both of them are formidable horror geeks. They can go into some seriously deep dives. You know, I can tell you about that side of them, but I've never sat down and really talked with Dave and Amy about, say, themselves or their love for the genre or, or what they think of Cinema Wasteland. Both of them have been attending Wasteland for about half of its 25 years. So they seem like a pretty good representation of Wastelanders that are somewhat veterans. Uh, plus, I'm fascinated by them because on the surface, they look like the straightest folks you'd ever meet. Folks could easily fit in at a sporting event instead of something like Cinema Wasteland. 
Now, one of my friends jokingly said that they are too good looking for wasteland, but all you need to do is spend a few minutes, even one minute, speaking to David and Amy, and you'll know that they are in the right place. Hello, this is David Runnick. I work for a software company. Um, I've been into going to conventions since 2005. My first convention was Cinema Wasteland, uh, and I've gone here twice a year ever since. I'm Amy Ronick, and I've been coming to Cinema Wasteland since 2008, and I'm just as a big fan of horror, and I've been that way since I was a kid. <laughs> My first experience with horror um, was when I was around eight years old. I remember I was coming in, it was the summertime, and uh, both of my parents were just sitting down, and on TV, it was the start of a black and white movie, and I remember when I walked into the family room, I was basically making comments about the fact that I didn't feel like watching a black and white movie, because it was already around probably like 8 o'clock at night or something like that, and I was you know, just ready to chill out and go to bed, but um, I do remember that uh, shortly, li- a little bit later, uh, the um, credits started rolling, and Night of the Living Dead uh, showed up on the screen. So that immediately piqued my interest. And from that point forward, I was completely engulfed in the movie. And I wanted to then see everything that was related to zombies. I was obsessed with that. Um, And my parents realized how interested I was. So they basically would go to the video store, find movies that were either made for kids, kind of like Monster Squad and things like that, and then they would rent them for me and bring them home so, you know, they could, you know, give me more of a feel. Um, then, obviously, I was diving into things like Universal Monsters and stuff like that, and it just went from there. Um, so when I was a little kid, my family all watched Psycho together as a family, <laughs> and it was, like, it was just so much fun. Like, we, we were all, like, joking about it at the end, and, like, we... My, I remember my brother tried to go to the bathroom and my parents went in and turned off the light and started making the psycho noises. So it was just kind of like a big fun community type thing, you know. So then after that, I became like obsessed with like fun, like scary movies, but they were like, so I, I watched Jaws and I absolutely loved Jaws. And then from there, like we just watched like all these different black and white movies. And um, on Saturday, I didn't have cable. So on Saturday afternoon, they would have like a horror movie. And it was fun to watch that with my family because like, it kind of gave me, if it, even if it was really scary, it gave me time to kind of like recover before bedtime so I could handle it. And so then I kind of got into it more and more. And then um, as I got older, my friends got into it. So it was almost like a big community type feel. Like we can watch a scary movie together and it's just like fun to just kind of experience that as a, as a group. So That's pretty interesting. Yeah. Most people don't have their whole family sit down and, and watch Psycho with them. Yeah. Uh, so you had a horror uh, show that you watched in, on Saturday. Did you have a horror host? No. Well, actually, so there was Big Chuck and Little John in yes. Cleveland, so yeah. they would show, like, some fun movies. Not always horror, but they'd always show fun movies. But, um, no, it would just be, I think it was, like, CBS would have, like, a just, like, a Saturday afternoon movie. So it would always just be something like um, Cat's Eye. I always remember watching Cat's Eye with my family, and, like, that, that little troll always freaked me out. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, so it was fun. Did you find uh, that you had a conspirator? Uh, who was your co-conspirator? Did somebody get you into it? Was it the whole family? Well, it was like the whole family because my parents actually liked it. Like when we were younger, my parents liked horror. But um, as I got older, my brother, I have an older brother, and he was like really into horror. So then like when I got to high school, like he was watching like Dawn of the Dead and like Last House on the Left and all that. So then I ended up watching all those movies and started getting deeper into horror from that. And then actually then when I met Dave, um, he got me into even more underground and introduced me to Cinema Wasteland. And so then, like, it just opened my whole world up with more horror movies. So, Well, for me, my, I mean, my big deep dive um, was actually by myself, being an only child. Uh, we had the movie channel. Mm-hmm. And on the movie channel in the late 80s, early 90s, Joe Bob Briggs yep, had his show. Yeah, I met him. Yeah, so I would actually, like, either my parents would be out and I would have a babysitter over. My babysitter would let me watch Joe Bob, and that's where I started to experience Basket Case and all that seriously deep dive stuff. And Basket Case terrified me as a kid, but <laughs> that feeling I absolutely loved. So then I kept chasing that feeling, and you know, I would go to the video store, whether it be a mom and pop, which is usually what I tried to go to, or Blockbuster. I would go into the horror section and Basically, you know, find the craziest covers, rent that movie completely blind, or look for the movies that had like the little stickers on this side that said, 
not suitable for people under 17 right. or whatever. And then I would rent those. So from there, you know, I, I accidentally rented a uh, house by the edge of the park. And Oof. I was very young when I saw that. And again, you know, experiencing that stuff for the first time, it was shocking, but it just made me keep wanting more and more. And then as I got older, more of my friends started to get into horror. So we would end up just like running movies on Fridays or Saturday nights, getting pizza and hanging out and watching them. So You talked about chasing the feeling. Mm-hmm. Do you know what the feeling is? It's tough. I mean, I guess like the first true feeling that I can remember being completely terrified was when I saw Pet Cemetery for the first time, which, I mean, it's an older movie. Or not older, but a newer movie, I guess. And I was a little older when I saw it. But but that movie horrified me so bad that, like, just the, the feeling of that complete fear and dread, for whatever reason, was, like, so interesting to me. Because, like, I was having trouble sleeping and everything else. And I'm like, how could a movie that I know is fake impact me that way? Mm-hmm. You know? And then, again, I was just trying to, like, constantly live for that fear and yeah I've been always chasing it ever since but you know nowadays we're pretty desensitized so (laughs) (laughs) well that's something that I I wanted to talk about as well because I've watched you know over a thousand movies being very conservative about the the amount that is it's way over that I'm sure but you know I no longer go expecting to get scared Mm -hmm. so that's not the key to the movies for me it's surprise what do you think it is for you that you're looking for um, at this point, there are some movies that still impact me a little bit here and there. Surpri- and I guess it is a surprise because, like, I'll go into it thinking I'm not going to be afraid or creeped out. Like, Paranormal Activity, when I saw that, I actually, yeah, it frightened me. And I wasn't expecting it, so I think it caught me off guard where I was more open to being frightened. And, like, we, you know, it also depends where you watch it and things like that, too. Like, we watched Lake Mungo mm-hmm. outside, oh, yeah. in the dark, on our deck, at our house, and we were completely terrified watching it. We watched it a few years later inside the house with the lights on and whatnot, not, you know, because we were afraid or anything, but it was a totally different experience, and it didn't impact us the way it had done the first time we watched it. So, like, y- you never know, but, yeah, things like that surprise you, and... That is still kind of what I'm hunting down, uh, but but yeah. And you you mentioned that uh, it was more familial in your yeah. your household. You, you laughed you laughed through Psycho with mom and yeah, dad, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> so what is it that you look for? Is it something that is like uh, trying to go to a darkness, or are you trying to find something that is exciting? I just like the excitement of it, like and just like Dave said, like the just the surprise element, like you know, what are we gonna expect? And sometimes like the storylines are just so unique and, and different. It's just it's kind of like it's fun. It's it's a fun experience to just see like what you're gonna get into. But I mean there are still movies that will scare me a little bit, like like the vanishing yeah. and that one, like the original, like oh, the yeah. Dutch I mean like that one really terrifies me. I think I think about that. Yeah. yeah. I think about that one all the time. Like, that one stuck with me, and it's just like something I never thought of, and it's just like it's it still like creeps me out. But. That's one that I talk about when people go, "Oh, the A twenty four stuff," and I like, "Dude, these movies have existed forever." Yeah. The idea of dread, where you don't have to have anything jump at you. It's right. just the idea of something so realistic yes. that it just gets you in the stomach, and the fact that we're following the killer. As yeah. much as we're following the obsessed guy. Yeah. And I was just like, wow, that's freaking cool. Yeah. So I see a, you need a uh, medical supply company hat on you. And I believe when I was walking by, I heard some impassioned conversations about Return of the Living Dead. So you want to talk a little bit about that movie and what it means to you guys? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, you know, Return of the Living Dead was probably like the introduction of myself to horror punk, death rock, and that whole genre of music that... I had no clue existed, but always probably wanted to have exist until I saw that movie. So when we watched it for the, well, when I watched it for the first time and I heard the songs in that movie, I immediately had to go and look up all the bands and hunt down the soundtrack. And then from there, deep dive into bands like The Cramps, The Damned, The Flesh Eaters, and then what actually is one of my favorite bands of all time, 45 Grave. Um, so I was actually just talking with my wife a few days ago because I told her that without Return of the Living Dead introducing me to that music, I actually probably would have never met her because uh, I I met her at a 
punk rock bar. And the reason why I was at that bar is because I was friends with quite a few people in the Cleveland area that are in the punk rock scene. And I met quite a few of those individuals actually at a concert in 2005 for 45 Grave because my friend's band opened for them. So it's just kind of funny how it all plays in where, like, I could tell her that I met you because of Return of the Living Dead. And, uh, again, you know, that movie changed my life, not only because I met my wife through that, but, you know, it got me really more deep into horror and the music in general. And, uh, yeah, it was just all senses. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? How do you feel about that movie? What is it that you keep coming back to? It? Oh, it's just like, I don't know, it's just like a great storyline. It's like a great soundtrack. It's just a fun movie. It's a movie that you can watch with friends. You can watch, you know, like just together like it's just I just love that movie but I never saw it until I met him and then he introduced me to that movie and we were I was like this is a really awesome movie and we watched it with all of our friends and um yeah it was just it was just a fun time I just liked that movie yeah I've got a funny story about that too yeah. as well so back in the 90s I was renting that movie so often from Blockbuster like literally almost every week that I went into Blockbuster around 1998 and was like Okay, look up like the last three years in the computer system and see how many times other people besides me rented this. And if you can sell it to me, I would be appreciative and whatever. So they actually looked it up and only like four other people had rented it in between that time. <laughs> so they sold it to me for $10. And it's like the hard shell VHS oh, wow. case, you know, that was on display on the shelf. So like I still own that Return of the Living Dead that I was always renting for many many years so just having that experience and you know being able to own it now being like the original one i watched it's, it's pretty shocking and, and fun that's pretty yeah. amazing so we get to cinema wasteland yeah and uh both of you uh, had you do, done conventions before or it was your first convention yeah so this is my first one yeah so with that what were you expecting when you walked in the door what made you come uh really what it was was the guests um now i don't remember who were the guests at the first one but uh you know just graduating college um and getting my first job we were able to have like a little bit of that extra spending money so we heard about this convention and obviously like the same group of people that were into like the punk rock death rock stuff uh we were all like let's go to cinema wasteland and check it out so we came here and we we're just completely floored at like the vendors because we had no idea that there was like this you know underground scene where people are doing art and making t-shirts and you know you can buy movie posters and then meet actors and actresses from some of these movies so that really like threw me for a loop and from that point forward i was like i can never miss a cinema wasteland <laughs> and after going here so many years like you become friends with everybody which you know it doesn't happen in a lot of other like niche you know groups i feel but everybody's like so open and easy to talk to like and inviting that you know you come out here you start talking to some vendors and then they introduce you to their friends and then you become friends with their friends and it's really nice yeah so that's one of the things uh, getting to talk with people yeah. like just having that openness what was it that surprised you about coming here? Where you came here, uh, obviously you knew there were going to be uh, people from the movies and stuff like that. But what was it that made you say, I need to start talking to people around here? I just felt like, um, you know, everybody was just so friendly and open in it. Like, they're so passionate about, like, the movies that they watch and why they like it. And it's, you know, when I first started coming here, I felt like I was a rookie. Like, because I didn't know a lot of the movies. And it really opened me up to all that, like, this whole genre of, like, more movies I've never seen. So, um, and it's just, it's really just a, a great environment to get to know people and find out what they like and why they like it. And then they recommend movies. And it's just, it's just fun that you have this whole community of people. And everybody's so friendly and so, like, open and willing to talk to people. And, and even if you're shy, I feel like people are still willing to, like, be open and talk to you, you know? Yeah. Just, Did you find yourself shy? You at first, yeah. I was, like, really shy about it because I just felt like I didn't know, like, I didn't know all these movies and everybody else seemed to be in the know. And I just kind of felt, like, out of place at first. And then, but when, as soon as I came here, like, everybody was just so open and willing to, like, introduce me to things. Like, well, if you've never seen this, then you've got to see this movie or you've got to check this out or check, you know, you've got to meet this person. So it was, um, it really opened me up. I, I felt like it was a really good commun communal, like, experience here. You, you mentioned people telling you, hey, you should see this movie. 
was that a big draw? Did it, did it really enrich where you went? Did it ch- change the avenues that you were looking for movies? Oh, for sure. I mean, I, for me, like I was going to like you know like Blockbuster or Family Video or something like that, and you know they have some you know horror selections, but they didn't have the level of like underground horror like this convention has. And I felt like this this just has like a wealth of movies that you would never find anywhere else, and it it just really opened opened me up to horror in a whole different way. Yeah, how about yourself? Yeah, for me it was like it was. Especially, like, after talking with more and more people. I mean, this was almost before, like, Vinegar Syndrome and Severin and stuff like that. So, like, I would hear things about movies, and I would have to go on torrent sites. I'm right. online to download them and then burn them to, like, a DVD that I, so I can actually watch it. Because, you know, there was no easy way of accessing some of these movies. And, you know, it even takes me back to, like, when I was in college, there was a mom-and-pop video store by me. And I was, like, the only person in my group of friends in college that liked horror movies pretty much. So I would pretty much just go to this family place and rent different movies, go on uh, Bloody Disgusting or, you know, some websites to try to find out, like, what movies are out there to hunt for. And, like, for me, Flesh Eater was, like, always one of those, like, pinnacle movies that I had to find because Bill Hinsman was in it and it was, you know, obviously tied to Night of the Living Dead and always talked about as being such, like, a insane horrible traumatizing movie and i i found a rental place by me uh, in college and i was able to actually watch it and then like having that experience where i hunted it down found it put it in my vhs player and watched it was like just such a i don't know <laughs> like religious experience i guess <laughs> yeah it has a heft I, yes. the first time that i saw snuff i had found snuff on a vhs and I swear that the tape was heavier than other tapes. And I picked it up. It's like, oh, my God, it's snuff. My, my, my holy grail at the moment when I first started finally getting into trying to find the more unknown films was Last House on Dead End Street. And it was like one of those that you heard about. And then when you finally saw it, it was like almost too muddy to even watch. But it meant something. Mm-hmm. It was like, I found this thing. So you get that here at Cinema Wasteland. Where did you get it before you started coming here? Uh, again, I, I mean, the internet was kind of in its infancy stages. Mm-hmm. So I subscribed to Fangoria right. and Gore Zone and some of those magazines. Um, and really, like, it was just going to different video stores, walking through the aisles, finding what looked interesting. And sometimes it was a win, sometimes it was a loss. But again, it was still an experience, you know, like, and you would take it, rent it, go home with yourself or some friends and you could even get a good laugh out of it if it wasn't as terrifying or crazy as you thought it was going to be i mean i know amy's got a fun experience with a shot on video movie where she rented it blindly and yeah. now it's one oh. of her favorites what one <laughs> truth or dare uh, <laughs> yes yes so when i was in uh well good cover yes it is so um i actually grew up like two blocks away from a little mom and pop video store so my best friend she lived two streets away from me so her and i Every weekend, we'd go down to that little video store, and we would rent something. We'd always look at whatever had the craziest cover, and, like, that's what we would rent. But we ended up renting Truth or Dare, and that became, like, one of our favorites because it was just so, like, cheesy, and it was just a good one to laugh at. And But um, I, I, like, watched that so much. I rented it constantly, kind of like Dave with his Return of the Living Dead. I would rent it all the time. And then the video store ended up closing, and I ended up being, like, I ended up buying that movie. I was so worried that that was going to be gone. I, like, rode my bike up there, and they were like, nobody nobody wants this movie. <laughs> like, you can have it. <laughs> so I still have that VHS tape yeah. today. Yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> What's your favorite moment that you've had so far while you've been there? Oh, wow. There's been so many. Um, I mean, I've, I've got to really say, though, it's just walking around and talking to everybody because, like, we've joked, like, over the years since we've got, gotten to know more and more people, it's actually tough to just make it through the one big loop of the room because you run into so many people that you can just talk for hours with. And that experience is not something that we have in everyday life. And, you know, we get it twice a year. So we want to make sure that we can absorb every moment, every second, you know, that we have here. And, you know, the guests are awesome especially because they always like Ken always pulls in like a lot of guests that are for some lesser known movies that we grew up with that love but uh but yeah it's it's really the camaraderie and 
being friends with everybody. <laughs> just, you know, we've made so many friends through, like, well, Cinema Wasteland and just all our conventions that, like, you know, they've become, like, really dear friends of ours. And so um, we see these, we see the Wasteland family more often than some of our other friends. And we have just, you know, that similar interest. It's just something that we can talk to that we can't always talk to with everybody else. Like, not everybody else has that same interest or knowledge, but we're, you know, we're friends. But, you know, it's just, um, it's just so unique here. I mean, we just, we just, it's like our family, <laughs> a little con family. <laughs> So the last interview that I want to share with you is the guy who got me in this mess in the first place, John Kitley. Now, it seems hard to believe that it's already been seven years since I first met John. You know, it kind of feels like yesterday, and at other times, it feels like we've known each other forever. John is one of the people who has been with Cinema Wasteland since day one. He was here on the first show. And Cinema Wasteland is just part of a much longer journey that he's been doing in the world of the horror genre. He's been deeply entrenched in fandom since he was a kid, and he was at some of the earliest conventions, like the first Fangoria convention in New York City. So he has been entrenched in this and lives and breathes it, and he has fun with it. So John's been writing for Horror Hound magazine for many years. He's written a book called Discover the Horror, and he's one of the contributors to the Discover the Horror podcast. But most importantly, John is one of the great champions of horror fandom. He's a historian of horror who welcomes everyone into the tribe. If they're willing to learn, if they're willing to talk, if they're willing to listen, if they're willing to share, he'll have them in. And he's wise enough to know that there's still more for him to learn as much as there is for anybody else. Obviously, uh, you've been a fan of uh, Cinema Wasteland for a while. How many shows have you been to now? All of them. Every one uh, of them. I've been here since the beginning of September of 2000, uh, and I have not missed one in uh, almost 24 years, 25 years almost. So there was a time before Cinema Wasteland, and uh, what precisely were you doing at that point? We were doing a few conventions, namely Fangoria, uh, Weekend of Horrors in New York, um, I've known Ken for a while and we'd see him at shows and he would always bitch about the current show and say, he's going to start his own show one of these days. And we'd laugh and, uh, see him at the next show and go through the same routine. And then at Wizard World in August of 1999, we went up to see him after we got set up and he gave us a flyer for the first cinema wasteland. And we were like, holy shit, he's actually going to do it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that was September of, of 2000 and it's, like no other show you're going to find. What were your expectations of Cinema Wasteland when you first heard about it? Um, I Because it was Ken. Ken had been a dealer since they invented him, I think. he We had confidence that he was going to run it from a dealer aspect. He knew what dealers go through. So some shows, dealers are, they pay for the room, and then that's all. They, they're an annoyance almost. But Ken's a dealer, so he knew, and he treated the dealers really well. It was well organized. There was plenty of stuff to do for fans coming in. And the funny thing is, is it hasn't changed at all in all those years. So you're, you're at the, the, the first wasteland. And what was, would you say was the first thing that you went, oh, wow, this might actually work? It felt like a different convention. It felt more, um, everybody coming through the door were really, diehard fans. It was a Dawn of the Dead reunion, and Ken had, I cannot even remember how many guests from the show. Um, everybody was super friendly. A lot, they were more approachable than the shows we had been to, where the guests would be carted out after a Q&A, and you get a few minutes to get a, hopefully get a signature. This, These guys were sitting in the dealer room, basically. Um, you had a chance to walk up and talk to them. It was more personable. Um, so that right from the beginning seemed different, which was a, a nice change. You talked about how you were going to some conventions before you actually ever got to Cinema Wasteland. So what was it like before you were starting to go to conventions? Uh, what was it like to be a fan? What were you doing as a fan? Well, I, my first convention, my first horror convention was in April of 88, Fango Show in, in California, which first time I ever met anybody famous. So it just... 
mind boggling walking through the lobby and there's George Romero standing there talking to fans and, uh, Roddy McDowell and just unbelievable. Um, so I was a fan, obviously a fan first and would try to go to at least one or two conventions a year. And this was back when there was only one or two conventions a year, not like now. And then at some point it, it's, the term dealer obviously references to like being a drug dealer. And the whole thing is that a drug dealer becomes a dealer to support his own habit. That is exactly for vendors or dealers at a movie convention. Cause I always thought, well, if I make a hundred bucks, if I spend a hundred bucks, I really didn't spend any money. <laughs> That's the kind of mind thinking that you do. So it, it just started with that. If I could make money, then I could spend more money and buy and increase my own collection and buy stuff. Um, plus you get to meet so many different people because you're at the table. People are coming up to you. You make a lot of new friends and you see the same vendors over and over again over time. Um, and there's people that I've met at Wasteland 30 or 20 something years ago that I'm still friends with today. So it continues. So when did you start writing? So you started as a fan and then you started going to conventions, uh, you became a vendor or, or did you, were you writing before that? Um, I probably, I might've done a little bit of writing prior to, but in 1998, I started my website, Kitley's Crypt. Um, and that was mainly just to have an outlet for my thoughts. I didn't really have a plan. I just wanted to be able to get on my soapbox and talk about what I liked, what I didn't like. And in the early days, it was a lot of DVD announcements or laser disc announcements, what was coming out. The longer I went, then the more technically, the more writing I would, actual writing I would be doing instead of little news bits. Um, and I honestly, I don't remember the exact year when I started writing for Horror Hound. They used to come here to this show, Nathan and Aaron, who started Horror Hound. And I remember the show that they brought the premiere issue. And he, Aaron asked me to, <clears throat> to write for him or to write something for him. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm working on my site. I'd rather do that. And then, uh, I don't know how many years later, four, a couple of years later, they asked me again if I wanted to do a column. And by that time, I'm like, I would be dumb not to. So, again, it's the whole point is to get people to watch different movies, to expand their knowledge of the genre. And I figured a column in a big magazine like Horror Hound would be the perfect opportunity. So, I've been doing that now ever since. Horror Hound just had their 100th issue which is mind boggling, but it's still fun. And I still get to reach fans to hope to get them to watch some different movies that they might not have heard before. So there's a whole thing about uh, cinema wasteland that I talk about, which is uh, if you're trying to explain this to somebody, they're going to look at you really strange. Like, why are you here to talk is like one of the weirdest things to say to somebody. And where are you going to go? I'm going to be at this, old holiday inn type building uh, we're not even in cleveland we're in strongsville we're, we're on the side of cleveland so what is it that you can say makes it so unique the 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 difference the difference that i found at wasteland and this is going to kind of be hard to say without sounding either an elitist or condescending and that's not my intention but when we do a horror hound that is a specific type of crowd that they're bringing usually more modern day a lot of freddie jason michael myers but wasteland goes beyond that and it goes beyond a certain era it, it specializes in the drive-in the exploitation area um time horror sci-fi but all in that kind of outside of mainstream hollywood when you come to wasteland and you bring up some euro horror star from the 60s most people are going to know what you're talking about you bring that up at other shows, maybe not as much. Um, so I, I don't want to say that the Wasteland fans are more educated, but they like that certain kind of outside of the mainstream collecting. And that was a nice, very refreshing thing to come to this show and someone hear someone say something about an Erica Blanc movie, and you're like, holy shit, you know who Erica Blanc is? And it just stems from there. So it's a different crowd. Um they're all diehard fans. They know who you're talking about. You know who they're talking about. So you have a different connection at this show than you do at a lot of other shows. 
Did you have an outlet before you started going to conventions? Where or were you uh, pen pal with people? What was it that you did? Yeah, that's that's that was thing. I, I used to tape trade movies with a bunch of people, so I, I did that with about six or seven different people from England, Canada, from Australia, because that's how you and and corresponded with people just pen pals because. I didn't have anybody that was obsessed about horror movies as much as I was. So you have to find your tribe. And you did that in the old days through pen pals or reaching them through ads and Fango. And you would build up that, that connection with these people. And they, you had that, you had the way to, you could express about your films before the internet, before all that stuff, this convention or any convention, these people got to get together. And then you have that same conversation, except now it's in person at a hotel somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And again, Wasteland was always different in that aspect. But technically, for me, I've made sure that I've done that at every show. You have to have that connection of that gathering of people where you can literally, even though there's a lot of joking and, and ribbing and stuff like that, but you have serious conversations about film, filmmakers, even if it's as silly as what's better, American Werewolf or The Howling, it's talking about film, and it's talking about film with a passion, a serious passion, that you can't get anywhere else. What I think is intriguing uh, is that most of the people that I know here are obsessives, sure, but they're also creators. It's like they, yes. can't, they can't be content just watching, even though the thing that gets us all together is watching. Everybody here seems to be obsessed in a, in a positive way. In other words, uh, you have specialists in every place. So who are the people that you go to that kind of even out your understanding of horror? So there's maybe someone that you go, this is a specialist in Asian films. This is the specialist. In, if I want to know something about Giallo, I go to this guy. That's a tough question. There's a lot of, there's certain people that I know, like Ryan Smith, who works for Dreamhaven, is just completely nuts over the Hong Kong cinema. I used to be in the Hong Kong stuff back in the 90s and got kind of out of it, gearing more towards horror. Talking to him at any given time brings back memories of when I was back in there and I'm remembering these names now. Um, but I think that's, I don't know if there's certain people that have specific specialties, so to speak. Um, because of this one, it's kind of like all one melting pot. We're all, and, and that's the, again, that's another great thing about conversations is we're talking and someone says, Oh, well, you know, those Mexican horror films and you may have someone off to the side go, wait a minute. What, what are you talking about? And now you've just sucked him in to the conversation and now he'll be out seeking new movies. And the other thing in the conversations is no matter how long you've been watching movies, there are a ton of stuff you have not seen. So there are, multiple times during a conversation someone whips out their phone or a notebook and go okay what was the name of that movie and you go from there so i, I don't know if i have a like specific people for specific for specific things but it's it's kind of like all together we're all in that same discussion i do i don't know half a dozen shows a year and they're all some of them are hell of a lot more crowded than this one there's more people attending but it's something like at Wasteland that is different. The the clientele that come here, the fans that come here, you're on the same playing field. Um, it's like, God, I hate using a baseball metaphor. But you go to a sports thing and 80% of the people are wearing Cub shirts and you're a Cub fan. You're like, these are my people. Instead of, yeah, you're all baseball fans. But these are my fans. These are the same on playing on. Wasteland is kind of the same thing where you come in here. And if you're wearing a giant claw t-shirt, people are going to go, hey, I like that shirt. That's a great movie. Whereas if I was at a different show, people would have no idea what that is. Which is what I used to do with uh, uh, band shirts. Yes. Concerts. Exactly. It's the same thing where you're, you're wearing something in pride that you admire, you like, and you get that recognition. And that tells you, it's not only great that someone else knows what you, you're wearing, but it tells you that. What I am wearing is important. Someone else feels the same way. So you have that connection. Even if it's literally just walking by, hey, dude, nice shirt. Yeah. It's that immediate going, that guy gets it too. Does this energize you creatively or is it just uh, emotionally, socially? I think it's both because 
you come out of these shows realizing that, A, you're not alone. You're not the crazy guy that is so obsessive about films that that's all you're thinking about. You come out of these shows going, I'm one of many. I am part of the collective. And we are bigger than you th- ever thought. And if, if you're one of those that is, sits at home and, and doesn't have that outlet or that tribe, you are not alone. You just need to find them because they are there. And even if it's done online, which if that's your only option, that's great. I would highly recommend that. But it does not replace the interaction amongst people, uh, the one-on-one or not one-on-one, but face-to-face. Uh, you cannot replace that. If you had to say what uh, Cinema Wasteland meant to you, you were talking to someone, and God forbid this was no longer happening, how would you explain it? Oh, man, you missed it. Yeah, that, it's it's one of those, and again, it's going to make me sound old, but it's one of those old glory day stores where you're like, oh, my God, you wouldn't, back in that day, that, those were shows were, were amazing. Any of my friends that that I knew from other shows or I knew and had not been to Wasteland, it, it was, you have to go to Wasteland. And a friend of mine, Dave Kosanke, who, uh, from Liquid Cheese, used to go to Chiller all the time. Dave, you got to come to Wasteland. Yeah, I heard, I heard. No, you have to come to Wasteland. He started, he came that first time, and I, from then on, he was here almost every show. So it's... It's whether that infection happens. And I know you did the same thing when you came to flashback. I'm like, you think this is good. This is fun. You got to come to Wasteland. And it's kind of like walking into Willy Wonka's candy thing where you're going, no, there's a lot of candy. Yeah, okay, I get it. I like candy. And then you walk in there and you're like, holy shit, there's a lot of candy here. It's kind of the same thing. So to try to explain someone that when that's gone... It's like, well, it's really cool. And they're like, yeah, okay. No, it's not that. It's really cool. So it, it's it's kind of hard because if you don't experience it, it's hard to explain just how good it is because no matter how you explain it, it's not. It's going to be better than that. What do you take away from Wasteland when you go back? And a lot of world? DVDs, a lot of books, <laughs> <All right>. posters, <laughs> uh, not a lot of money. Um it's got one of the best dealer rooms. It's a family reunion. You get to see your your convention family. Um, you get to sit and hang out and talk. And it's it's literally like if the show wasn't even here, it's that collection of people. And to me, that means that's more important than the events. Not that those aren't great, but it's the connection with people. Because as a horror fan growing up, when you don't have a lot of people that you can connect with that don't understand why you're so passionate about this film from the forties. It it can drive you mad. And I think this is like almost letting steam off where you're, that pressure is building up or out or in the outside world where it's just beating you down. You get to come here and hear some guy go, what's this, what's this movie? The body snatcher is I heard that's good. And now you can sit there and have this conversation about a movie that came out 80 years ago. So it's, it's re, it re-energizes you that you are definitely not the one, that there's more people out there that are just as passionate, if not more, than you are. And it, it just it makes you realize that what you're doing is not for waste. One of the things that I think is really great about the the fans that come is how they treat the guests that show up. So talking about the guests themselves, uh, as you may have already heard from me, uh, they're not necessarily marquee people now, but they're considered marquee people to the folks who come to Cinema Wasteland. You know, for many of the actors and directors who made horror films, especially low-budget independent horror films from, say, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, you know, they had no idea that there was any love for their movies but there are so many movies that uh, they make a slight ripple when they first come out for these folks uh, and then they disappear some of them didn't get paid at all because those movies didn't make enough if they're lucky some of these actors worked on a few more horror movies they're really fortunate they did see a royalty check or two 
the filmmakers and the artists who made these low-budget indie horror films were kind of journeyman folk. They went from one job to the next to producing work for themselves year after year, sometimes you know, working on other people's stuff, uh, going into commercials, going into radio, going into being at car dealerships and, and uh, things like that. Uh, many of the people that come to Cinema Wasteland uh, come there not in the business anymore, but when they leave, they have a little glimmer of business again. There are several people that I've made friends with on Facebook that I watch their careers start to grow again. Now, their career may be nothing more than going from convention to convention, uh, working in uh, plays, whatever it might be, but they get rekindled by what happens at Cinema Wasteland. And that is just this wonderful adoration that's sincere, that comes from fans who are true collectors, who are true cineasts, people who absolutely love these movies and love what these people had given them. I like to think that we are paying back what we were given from these actors by having them come here and remind them why what they did was so important. It may have seemed somewhat trivial because the business itself likes to say that the stuff that they were doing was trivial. But to us, these fans, none of it was ever trivial. We always enjoyed it. We always found it very important. Some of these movies got us through a lot of crazy shit. And so getting to meet people and tell them that uh, is so important to us. And because many of these folks, they made their appearances in these movies back in the 60s and 70s, they're older now. And so when they're here, uh, at times it can be somewhat bittersweet. I will say that many of the people that I have met are no longer with us. And I'm somewhat a newbie. So people who have been there from the very beginning, they have a long list of people that they were able to say hello to and tell them thank you. But many of these folks, they're no longer around. <laughs> I have my own One of the story great secrets that. of my visits was that I would come in on Thursday and I would take a van uh, from the airport to the hotel, of course, the hotel van. And many times I'm getting in at the same time that the celebrities are showing up. And that essentially gave me about 20 minutes of undivided attention with them as they're coming into Cleveland, maybe for the first time. Many of the times that I sat in that van, I was with people who had never been to Cinema Wasteland before, uh, hadn't been to a convention in years, if ever, and they're somewhat uh, nervous. And so I hoped to be the best welcoming committee that I could be without being an official Cinema Wasteland personnel. When the convention finally starts and they're behind a table, they're on. And at this point, we were just talking like human beings and then slowly letting me tell them that I know who they are. And, and most of the time, they want to release a little bit of stress from all of that travel. So I had great conversations with Jack Ketchum. We didn't know it at the time because he didn't tell anybody, of course, but he was dying of cancer. And it was one of the last shows that he was going to do. But he ended up having a great time. And because we spent all this time in the van, just kind of shooting the shit. The rest of the weekend when he saw me, he'd come over and say hi. We'd joke with each other. And that happens over these weekends. Uh, one of my favorites as well was Diane Thorne. Now, Diane Thorne is a notorious name in exploitation films. One of the movies that a lot of people think is unforgivable is Ilsa, She-Wolf of the SS. And Ilsa uh, is, uh, of course, Diane. It's Nazi exploitation done at the highest levels. And, and her performance is legendary and notorious. And she was there with her husband, Howard Marr. And Howard was a conductor and a actor as well. He was in five different movies with Diane. At the time when I saw her, she was quite frail. She was in a wheelchair. I gave them some help getting her into the van and also tried to stay out of their way. And of course, Diane decided to make a conversation with me and thank me. 
and uh, she let me know that she had fallen off of her horse and uh, that's why uh, she had a hip that just wasn't repairing itself that easily. So I spent a little bit of time talking about how much I admired her work and we laughed. She's like, oh God, I'm an ordained minister now and I marry people. Not too many people know that I'm Ilsa and Yet she came with full regalia, right? She came with uh, riding boots, the black boots that she wore as Ilsa. And Howard started talking to me, and Howard is full of a million stories of being a conductor in Las Vegas for a bunch of big names and some mobsters. So it was a, it was a day of getting a lot of great conversations. But what I bring Diane up for is because when I first see her, She's coming into the world of cinema wasteland from the real world. And in the real world, she's in a wheelchair and she's, you know, she's very tiny and she's traveling and she's irritable about all that. But she's about to fall into the wonderful fantasy world that is the wasteland. But what was great was the first day that Diane hit the floor where her table was, where she was going to be doing autographs. And as soon as she got there, she had the boots on, she stood straight up, she walked around on her own, and she seemed like she was six feet tall. And she commanded the place. And there was a line to see Diane. And you could just see this wash over her. And by the end of the weekend, she's of great voice and boisterous and flirting with everybody and just having a great time. And Diane's no longer with us, but I'm really glad that I got to spend some time with her. I'm glad more, though, that she got to meet hundreds of fans in that weekend that just let her know. Yes, some people might think it's a silly little movie, but it mattered to them because they were entertained by her. And sometimes there's nothing more wonderful than giving someone a little bit of entertainment. So like every cinema wasteland that I've attended, Sunday is, uh, you know, a mixed bag. Uh, We're saying goodbye to people slowly. It's a slow procession out of the place. For people who have driven four to eight hours to get to cinema wasteland, they're on their way home to be able to get up in the morning and go to work one more time. And I always spend time there uh, because I don't leave until the next day watching everything come down, get broken down and put in boxes. Over the years, I've been able to make friendships with a lot of the vendors. So I'm not just sitting there alone watching. I spend time talking with people. And so this time, it was a little bit different. So I had mentioned before that there was a convention happening Friday to Sunday, but on Monday, there was going to be a total solar eclipse in the area. So one of the things that was really interesting this time was that there was a level of tension in the hotel that there normally isn't. And that's because every hotel in the area was already pre-sold and sold out for the Eclipsers. So the Wastelanders were going to be supplanted by the Eclipsers. And there was this whole thing of like, you can't keep your bags here. You can't stay any longer. Luckily, I had the room until Monday, so I didn't have to worry. But for some people, they had to get out of the hotel quickly because they had people showing up to clean all of these rooms. They had 350 or 400 rooms that they had to clean in a few hours just to be able to be ready for the Eclipsers who were going to start coming in around 4 o'clock. Now, Cinema Wasteland ends officially at 4 o'clock. And check-in starts at four. So, where we normally have emptiness and quiet, there's suddenly chaos. If you want to know a little bit about the, the melancholy of the Sunday evening, you can listen to episode four, where I talk about how it's dead quiet. It slowly turns into uh, a normal holiday inn. Uh, they're throwing away all of the old poster work that was from Cinema Wasteland. And it's almost as if like a magical fog is dissipating in this place and you're just returned back to the regular life. Well, this time, maybe not so much. <laughs> there is absolute chaos going on. There is a line of people out the door. 
people are screaming at each other because they've been on the road God knows how long to come and watch this eclipse. And what I can say is that they don't trash the place as bad as we do, but they trash each other a lot worse. (laughs) So yeah, we do a little bit of damage to the place. You know, bathrooms don't look fantastic. The elevators get overused. Now, for the first time ever, probably, Sunday evening, the elevators are broken down because there are so many people trying to get in it. There is just madness everywhere and people are angry. They're traveled all this way to go see the sun get blocked out by the moon, and they are losing their shit in the foyer of this Best Western. Could not wait to get to bed and packed and get the hell out of there. Normally, a little bit sad. This time, nothing but absolute chaos. You know, I would have loved to have seen the eclipse. I would have loved to have stayed another day, but I didn't think of it at the time. Uh, and there was no way to get an extra room. And there were no rooms anywhere in the greater Cleveland area that weren't taken up because this was a huge, momentous event. I leave Cleveland, but I get to St. Louis and I'm stuck in the airport there. And I'm in the airport as the eclipse is starting to happen. So I'm watching on my phone the live event as it's going across the globe, starting in Mexico and moving its way across the country. And I start to get a little bit emotional because I'm seeing how people are kind of coming together on this. Yes, there was the chaos and madness at the hotel, but now that the event is actually happening, this special event, all of a sudden people who normally would not mix, who might not know each other at all, who might just be showing up in these weird places like Cleveland for the first time for something that seems momentous to them, that matters to them, and they drop all pretenses and just look in awe And people cheer as everything goes dark. And some people cry. And I'm starting to get emotional myself because I'm watching over and over again as the hours go by. And it's coming to me, right? In St. Louis, they're not going to get 100%, but we're still going to get dark there. I'm not able to see it. The sun is going to be directly above the airport at the time. So all I can do is look out at the flight line and see all of the people who are the baggage handlers and stuff standing there with sunglasses on, looking up as everything goes dark. And why this made me really feel like I had to write about Cinema Wasteland was that there's not going to be another one of these eclipses, total eclipses hitting the United States, I think for another 25 years. And it won't hit that area again for hundreds of years. And so it is a rare event to come together and spend time and enjoy something that is just strange and unusual. And so I felt this idea that, you know, everything is impermanent, right? The people who are watching that, people who are chasing the eclipse across the globe, across the world, following eclipses as they happen every year, going to different areas. You know, they've done that for decades. There are people there who are in their 80s that remember the one from the 70s, that remember the one that came before that. And they realize that this is probably the last eclipse they're going to see, and they're seeing it with their loved ones, they're seeing it with people that they care about. And so, I have no idea how many cinema wastelands are left. (laughs) But you know what? I think I'm going to cherish every one that I go to. Because I don't necessarily know what's going to happen once this thing ends. I'm sure we'll find something else. The world is not going to end. But a certain wonderful weirdness is going to end. And so let's hope. I don't think that the next, this has been the last wasteland. In fact, if Ken Kish heard me say this, he probably would go one more year just to spite me for saying this kind of thing. Uh, But at some point it is going to end. The place itself is a placeholder, 
It's a spot, a sacred place that we come to. But what makes that so sacred is the people who show, the people who feel that this is something special. You cannot make a sacred place. You can't do that on purpose. It happens on its own. I'm just glad that I've had my moment with all these people. You know, everything changes, everything ends, and someday I will too. But not yet. And until I'm gone, I'm going to have a little bit of fun. Thanks so much for listening to the show. Now, one of the things that I mentioned in this episode was that I had this place, this sacred place as a kid, and it was the dumpster behind Burger King. That might resonate with you. And if it does, I mentioned that I like to get into conversations. So reach out to me. You can get in touch with me at scott at hellbentforhar.com. You can find me on Facebook. You can go to my website, hellbentforhar.com. I would love to hear from you about that. This episode of Hellbent for Horror is brought to you by Patreon supporters and listeners just like you. If you enjoy Hellbent for Horror, please consider supporting the show by contributing either on our Patreon site or maybe PayPal. We have other things you can take a look at if you want to go to the website. You can find links for that at hellbentforhorror.com. And I thank you for helping sustain the show. Thanks for listening, though the most important thing. Tell other people about it. That's also super important. That's what I consider contributions. Hellbent for Horror was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lisa Gorski. You can find more about us on our website, hellbentforhorror.com. I'm also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash hellbentforhorror. Pretty easy to find. You can find Hellbent for Horror, the podcast, on iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify, and other podcast platforms. H4H has its own app as well, so you can download that from Google or Amazon Store for Android, and the iPhone version is available on iTunes, as one would expect. And I want to thank you again for listening, and until next time, stay hellbent. Hellbent.